The bank still didn't talk to us, but they did release a, a press release. Um, this is from the UK Cars Association, who act as spokesman for the banking industry in the UK. So the first thing they said is that when a car company receives a claim about a fraudulent transaction, they will always rely on the primary evidence to review the facts, and they would never use a paper receipt for evidence. Because remember, in this case, the paper receipt will, see, will say the PIN was verified correctly, and supposedly the banks will not rely on that. But it turns out that claim is just simply wrong. Here's a letter, again, from American Express, where you can see that there's a disputed transaction here for a few thousand pounds, and it says that um, we were provided a copy of the till receipts confirming these charges were verified by PIN. And in this particular case, the only evidence that Annex have that this was a PIN verified transaction is these receipts. But these receipts aren't worth the paper they're written on because of this flaw in the protocol. The Cars Association also said that the industry is confident that forensic signature of such an attack is easily detectable within the data available at the time of the transaction. <laughs> so, is this always the case? Well, here's a, another transaction which was being disputed. This was for someone on holiday, and there was a, um, about um, six, eight thousand pounds worth of um, foreign currency taken out from his account, and then they say that. These are computerized records, so you can rely on them. And also, um, according to our records, all successful transactions were authorized with a genuine card and the correct personal identification number. Well, fortunately, this customer is able to get a copy of the receipt, the receipt that was generated by the shop in these cases. And here's a copy of it. And it's got these cryptic hexadecimal characters at the bottom. But if we zoom in on byte 3 in there, um, which is a 08, and going back to that table, that says the PIN entry was acquired, the PIN pad was present, but the PIN was not entered. So the banks don't know. <laughs> so either the banks aren't keeping proper records, or they don't know how to interpret their records to know when the PIN was entered in correctly or not. And finally, they said that neither the banking industry nor the police have any evidence of criminals having the capability to deploy such sophisticated attacks. Our research suggests that criminal interest in chip-based attacks is minimal at the time as they are unable to find ways to make sufficient amounts of money from any of the plausible attack scenarios. Yeah. So this is essentially criminals are stupid. So one of the objections to our attack is that criminals wouldn't be able to do this because they'd have to carry a backpack into a shop, and somehow shops don't like that. Um, <laughs> so they said that in order for criminals to do that, they would need to shrink it. And this is far too sophisticated for them because criminals can't make miniature electronics, um, but then there's skimmers and all those things that um, have mobile phones and, and all sorts of very clever things that they're perfectly capable of doing. Um, so one of our, our master's students, um, Omar Chowdhury, um, looked at how difficult it was to build one of these things, and that's what he came up with. So, <laughs> this is um, about the same size as a pack of cards, and um, it's got a battery, it's got a, a screen and a card reader, and a fake card coming off the, the other side. Um, the, reason, the main reason he built this was not to develop a device that was designed for use in fraud, but to help prevent it. So, what this does is, if you use it in a transaction, it will tell you what the card is really seeing because criminals have compromised chip and pin terminals and that would allow them to commit a type of fraud where you think you're paying one amount of money because that's what's being displayed on the screen, but the card is authorizing vastly larger sum of money. So with this device, um, it, it was able to keep a log of the transactions, so you got evidence if you're going to get in a dispute, and it's got a screen, so it will show you the transaction. And it's got a few buttons, and you can say, do you authorize this or not? And uh, we've tried some demos with that. But in addition, because it sits between a card and a terminal, it's able to write a little bit of extra software for carrying out this attack. Um, it's based around a, an AVR8 microcontroller, um, so it's quite easy to, to work with. And I can show you a video of this where it was demonstrated on French TV. Bancaire, dont il ne connaît pas les codes. Ok, je pense à là. Sans code, il ne peut théoriquement pas s'en servir. 
Il faut d'abord introduire la carte ici. Ensuite, vous allumez l'appareil. Et voilà, nous sommes prêts pour la transaction. Direction un centre commercial de Cambridge. Dans un grand magasin multimédia, Omar s'amuse à faire son shopping. J'ai pris Avatar, je crois que c'est pas mal. Et Ninja Assassin. Je ne sais pas ce que c'est, mais j'adore la jaquette. Bon, maintenant, autour des livres. Harry Potter pour ma femme. Ça fait combien en tout Environ 50 livres. Vous pensez que ça va marcher Vous verrez bien. Puis c'est le passage en caisse. Omar va utiliser le piège à carte bleue, dissimulé sous sa manche. « 57 livres 98, s'il vous plaît. » Le chercheur paye. Le caissier ne remarque rien d'anormal. « Je rentre n'importe quel code. »« 4 x 0, ce n'est pas le bon code. »« Et pourtant... »« C'est bon ?»« Oui, c'est bon. »« C'est bon. Okay. » So that demonstration was done in October 2010, which is almost a year since the representatives of the French banking industry said that this attack doesn't work on French cards. <laughs> so that brings us into December 2010. Um, so this is now over a year since the banks were first notified. And now, for some reason, the UK Cars Association tried a little bit of a different tack. They tried to remove the documents from the web. The, <laughs> this is a, a section from their letter. It's all available online if you want to read the full thing. Um, they said that it is the publication of this level of detail which we believe breaches the boundary of responsible disclosure. <laughs> Essentially, it places in the public domain a blueprint for building a device which purports to exploit a loophole in the security of chip and pin. Consequently, we would ask that this research be removed from public access immediately and hope that you can give us some comfort about your policy towards future disclosures. <laughs> so it's hard to know where to start when ex in explaining how wrong this is. <laughs> so the first thing is it doesn't... Um, place in the public domain a device which um, carries out this fraud. The website uh, where Omar gives away the source code and schematics for this device very clearly says that he did not include the code for carrying out this attack. Um, also, I don't think this breaches um, responsible disclosure. This is, we gave the bank three months notice in private and it's now been over a year since they were notified and so far only one UK bank has fixed it. The rest of the banks are still as vulnerable as they were when we first told them. So it didn't get um, very much traction within the university, and Ross Anderson wrote a letter back. Um, it's well worth reading the full one. It's quite fun, but here's one of the sections. Second, you seem to think that we might censor a student's thesis, which is lawful and already in the public domain, simply because a powerful interest finds it inconvenient. This shows a deep misconception of what universities are and how we work. Cambridge is the University of Erasmus, of Newton and of Darwin. Censoring writings that offend the powerful is offensive to our deepest values. And what happens when you have some censorship? You have media coverage. So <laughs> we managed to get on Reddit, Slashdot, Independent, um, Heiser, um, Mail Online. And when I looked this morning, oops, um, there were 103 news articles about this story. And if we want to see the effect this has on suppressing information, here's the downloads of it.
So I think it's fair to say that it's been highly counterproductive to try to remove this material from the web. Okay. So I think this all comes back to the original claim at the beginning of my talk. Um, I think one of the major reasons that the UK bank industry has been trying to remove this material is not because it is um, going to help criminals. The criminals already know how to build these sorts of devices. It's not hard. But what it does do is harm the bank credibility when they try to refuse customers being refunded. And we've already heard people who have been able to use the material that we presented in order to get their money back. <laughs> 